Hello everyone, thanks again for joining us for our chapter book story time here at the Caribou Public Library. I'm Miss Erin and we are reading the story of Dr. Doolittle by Hugh Lofting. We're on chapters 7 and 8 today, so thanks for joining us and here we go. <laughs> Chapter 7 is called The Bridge of the Apes. Oh, and here's a picture of Queen Ermintrude. <laughs> Queen Ermintrude had never in her life seen her husband so terrible as he got that night. He gnashed his teeth with rage. He called everybody a fool. He threw his toothbrush at the palace cat. He rushed around in his nightshirt and woke up all his army and sent them into the jungle to catch the doctor. Then he made all his servants go too, his cooks and his gardeners and his barber and Prince Bumpo's tu tutor. Even the queen, who was tired from dancing in a pair of tight shoes, was packed off to help the soldiers in their search. All this time, the doctor and his animals were running through the forest toward the land of the monkeys as fast as they could go. Gub-Gub, with his short legs, soon got tired, and the doctor had to carry him, which made it pretty hard when they had the trunk and the handbag with them as well. The king of the Jol Joliginki thought it would be easy for his army to find them because the doctor was in a strange land and would not know his way. But he was wrong because the monkey, Chi-Chi, knew all the paths through the jungle, better even than the king's men did. And he led the doctor and his pets to the very thickest part of the forest, a place where no man had ever been before, and hid them all in a big hollow tree behind or between high rocks. We'd better wait here, said Chi-Chi, till the soldiers have gone back to bed. Then we can go on into the land of monkeys. So there they stayed the whole night through. They often heard the king's men searching and talking in the jungle around about them. But they were quite safe, for no one knew of that hiding place but Chi-Chi, not even the other monkeys. At last, when daylight began to come through the thick leaves overhead, they heard Queen Ermintrude saying, in a tired voice, that it was no use looking any more, that they might as well go back and get some sleep. As soon as the soldiers had all gone home, Chi-Chi brought the doctor and his animals out of the hiding place and they set off for the land of the monkeys. It was a long, long way, but they often got very tired. Oh, and they often got very tired, especially Gub-Gub. But when he cried, they gave him milk out of the coconuts, which he was very fond of. They always had plenty to eat and drink because Chi-Chi and Polynesia knew all the different kinds of fruits and vegetables that grow in the jungle and where to find them, like dates and figs and ground nuts and ginger and yams. They used to make their lemonade out of the juice of wild oranges sweetened with honey, which they got from the bees' nests in hollow trees. No matter what it was they asked for, Chi-Chi and Polynesia always seemed to be able to get it for them, or something like it. They even got the doctor some tobacco one day when he had finished what he had brought with him and wanted to smoke. At night, they slept in tents made of palm leaves on thick, soft beds of dried grass. And after a while, they got used to walking such a lot and did not get so tired and enjoyed the life of travel very much. But they were always glad when the nighttime came and they stopped for their resting. Then the doctor used to make a little fire of sticks. And after they had had their supper, they would sit round it in a ring, listening to Polynesia singing songs about the sea or to Chi-Chi telling stories of the jungle. And many of the tales that Chi-Chi told were very interesting, because although the monkeys had no history books of their own before Dr. Doolittle came to write them for them, they remember everything that happens by telling stories to their children. And Chi-Chi spoke of many things his grandmother had told him, tales of long, long ago, before Noah and the flood, of the days when men dressed in bearskins and lived in holes in the rock and ate their mutton raw because they did not know what cooking was, never having seen a fire. He told them of the great mammoths and lizards as long as a train that wandered over the mountains in those times, nibbling from the treetops. And often they got so interested listening that when he had finished, they found their fire had gone right out and they had to scurry around to get more sticks to build a new one. Now, when the king's army had gone back and told the king they couldn't find the doctor, the king sent them out again, told them they must stay in the jungle until they caught him. 
So all this time, while the doctor and his animals were going along toward the land of the monkeys, thinking themselves quite safe, they were still being followed by the king's men. If Chi Chi had known this, they would most likely have hidden, he would most likely have hidden them again, but he didn't know it. One day, Chi Chi climbed up a high rock and looked out over the treetops. When he came down, he said that they were now quite close to the land of the monkeys and would soon be there. And that same evening, sure enough, they saw Chi Chi's cousin and a lot of other monkeys who had not yet gotten sick, sitting in the trees by the edge of the swamp, looking and waiting for them. When they saw the famous doctor really came, these monkeys made a tremendous noise, cheering and waving leaves and swinging out the branches to greet him. They wanted to carry his bag and his trunk and everything he had. And one of the bigger ones even carried Gub Gub, <laughs> who had gotten tired again. Then two of them rushed on in front to tell the sick monkeys that the great doctor had come at last. But the king's men who were still following had heard the noise of the monkeys cheering and they knew at last where the doctor was and hastened on to catch him. The big monkey carrying Gub Gub was coming along behind slowly and he saw the captain of the army sneaking through the trees. So he hurried after the doctor and told him to run. Then they all ran harder than they ever had run in their lives and the king's men coming after them began to run too and the captain ran hardest of all. Then the doctor tripped over his medicine bag and fell down in the mud and the captain thought he would surely catch him this time. But the captain had very long ears, though his hair was very short. And as he sprang forward to take hold of the doctor, one of his ears caught fast in a tree and the rest of the army had to stop and help him. By this time, the doctor had picked himself up and on they went again, running and running. And Chi Chi shouted, it's all right, we haven't far to go now. But before they could get into the land of the monkeys, they came to a steep cliff with a river flowing below. This was the end of the kingdom of Jol Joliginki, and the land of the monkeys was on the other side, across the river. And Jip, the dog, looked down over the edge of the steep, steep cliff and said, Golly, how are we ever going to get across? Oh dear, said Gub Gub, the king's men are quite close now. Look at them, I'm afraid we're going to be taken back to prison again. <laughs> this is a picture of the monkeys when they were cheering and they knew that the doctor had come. Oh dear, oh Gub Gub began to weep again. But the big monkey who was carrying the pig dropped him on the ground and cried out to the other monkeys, Boys, a bridge, quick, make a bridge. We've only got a minute to do it. They've got the captain loose and he's coming on like a deer. Get lively, a bridge, a bridge. The doctor began to wonder what they were going to make the bridge out of. And he gazed around to see if they had any boards hidden any place. But when he looked back at the cliff, there hanging across the river was a bridge already for him made of live monkeys. For while his back was turned, the monkeys, quick as a flash, had made themselves into a bridge just by holding hands and feet. And one, the big one, shouted to the doctor, walk over, walk over all of you, hurry. Gub Gub was a bit scared walking on such a narrow bridge at that dizzying height above the river, but he got over all right and so did all of them. <laughs> John Doolittle was the last to cross and just as he was getting to the other side, King's men came rushing up to the edge of the cliff. Then they shook their fists and yelled with rage, for they saw that they were too late. The doctor and all of his animals were safe in the land of the monkeys, and the bridge was pulled across to the other side. Then Chi Chi turned to the doctor and said, Many great explorers and gray-bearded gray naturalists have lain long weeks hidden in the jungle, waiting to see the monkeys do that trick but we never let a foreign man get a glimpse of it before. You are the first to see the famous bridge of apes. And the doctor felt very pleased. <laughs> Here they are crossing on top of the bridge made of monkeys. <laughs> All right, chapter eight is called The Leader of the Lions. 
John Doolittle now became dreadfully, awfully busy. He found hundreds and thousands of monkeys sick. Gorillas, orangutans, chimpanzees, dog-faced baboons, marmosets, gray monkeys, red ones, all kinds. And many had died. The first thing he did was to separate the sick ones from the well ones. Then he got Chi-Chi and his cousin to build him a little house of grass. The next thing, he made all the monkeys who were still well come and to be vaccinated. And for three days and three nights, the monkeys kept coming from the jungles and the valleys and the hills to the little house of grass. Here they are, all in the line <laughs> to see the doctor. Uh, they went to the house of grass where the doctor sat all day and all night, vaccinating and vaccinating, so the well would not get sick. Then he had another house made, a big one, with a lot of beds in it, and he put all the sick ones in this house. But so many were sick, there were not enough well ones to do the nursing. So he sent messages to the other animals, like the lions and the leopards and the antelopes, to come and help with the nursing. But the leader of the lions was a very proud creature, and when he came to the doctor's big house full of beds, he seemed angry and scornful. Do you dare to ask me, sir, he said, glaring at the doctor. Do you dare to ask me, me, the king of beasts, to wait on a lot of dirty monkeys? Why, I wouldn't even eat them between meals. Although the lion looked very terrible, the doctor tried hard not to seem afraid of him. <laughs> Here's the doctor with the lion, and he is trying not to seem afraid. I didn't ask you to eat them, he said quietly. Besides, they're not dirty. They've all had a bath this morning. Your coat looks as though it needed brushing badly. Now listen, and I'll tell you something. The day may come when the lions get sick, and if you don't help the other animals now, the lions may find themselves left all alone when they are in trouble. That often happens to proud people. The lions are never in trouble. They only make trouble, said the leader, turning up his nose, and he stalked away into the jungle, feeling that he had been rather smart and clever. Then the leopards got proud too and said that they wouldn't help. And then of course, the antelopes, although they were too shy and timid to be rude to the doctor like the lion, they pawed the ground and smiled foolishly and said that they had never been nurses before. And now the poor doctor was worried frantic, wondering where he could get help enough to take care of all these thousands of monkeys in bed. But the leader of the lions, when he got back into his den, saw his wife, the queen lioness, come running out to meet him with her hair untidy. One of the cubs won't eat, she said. I don't know what to do with him. He hasn't taken a thing since last night. And she began to cry and shake with nervousness, for she was a good mother, even though she was a lioness. So the doctor, or so the leader went to his den and looked at his children, two very cunning little cubs lying on the floor. And one of them seemed quite poorly. Then the lion told his wife quite proudly, just what he had said to the doctor. And she got so angry, she nearly drove him out of the den. You never did have a grain of sense, she screamed. All of the animals from here to the Indian Ocean are talking about this wonderful man and how can he can cure any of the sicknesses and how kind he is. The only man in the whole world who can talk to the language of the animals. And now, now when we have a sick baby on our hands, you must go and offend him. You great booby, nobody is a fool. Oh, nobody but a fool is ever rude to a good doctor. You... She started pulling her husband's hair. Go back to that man at once, she yelled. Tell him you're sorry and take all the other empty-headed lions with you with those stupid leopards and antelopes. And then do everything the doctor tells you. Work hard and perhaps he will be kind enough to come and see the cub later. Now, be off. Hurry, I tell you, you're not fit to be a father. And she went into the den door where another mother lion lived and told her all about it. Yikes. So the leader of the lions went back to the doctor and said, I happened to be passing this way and thought I'd look in. Got any help? No, said the doctor, I haven't, and I'm dreadfully worried. 
Helps pretty hard to get these days, said the lion. Animals don't seem to want to work anymore. Can't blame them in a way. Well, seeing you're in difficulties, I don't mind doing what I can, just to oblige you, so long as I don't have to wash the creatures. And I have told all the other hunting animals to come and do their share. The leopards should be here any minute now. Oh, and by the way, we have a sick cub at home, myself. I don't think there's much the matter with him, but the wife is anxious. If you are around that way this evening, you might take a look at him, will you? Then the doctor was very happy, for all the lions and the leopards and antelopes and the giraffes and zebras, all the animals of the forest and the mountains of the plains, the mountains and the plains, came to help him in his work. There were so many of them that he had to send some away and kept only the cleverest. And now very soon, the monkeys began to get better. At the end of the week, the big house full of beds was half empty. And at the end of the second week, the last monkey had gotten well. Then the doctor's work was done, and he was so tired that he went to bed and slept for three days without even turning over. Wow. <laughs> that was hard work. Well, that's it for tonight. We will continue on with chapters 9 and 10 tomorrow. Have a great night, everyone. Bye for now.